a hopeless case tonight. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We serve an able God. Amen, amen. You can be seated. You know, every now and then when you get up here, you just feel stuff. And it's kind of hard sometimes to describe unless you've, you've been in this spot, but you can feel the spirit and sometimes the direction that God wants to take. And you can feel the things that are coming back at you. It's not always bad, but sometimes you can feel despair. You can feel a spirit of hopelessness tonight. Amen. I'm glad this is a church that preaches hope. There is hope in the midst of this troubled world. We want to take up the tithes and offerings tonight. If you need an envelope in which to place your tithes and offering, would you raise your hand? The ushers will see that one. See that. They'll bring you one. Amen. A reminder, our sacrificial offering deadline is next our Sunday, March 31st. That's going to be Easter Sunday for those that are still paying their pledges. And if you'll please write sacrificial offering on the envelope. So the sacrifice, uh, sacrificial offering pledges is due by Easter Sunday, March 31st. We want to welcome all of our first-time guests. If you have not already filled out an information card in the foyer, you can text the word WELCOME to 919-364-5236. We have a special gift for our first-time guests. It's the word WELCOME to 919 919- three six four five two three six let us pray over this offering tonight lord jesus we love you thank you god for another opportunity to come in your house to give you praise lord you are a god that offers hope today we are in a place of safety and we thank you for that thank you for everything that you have done you have provided god we've come to worship you with our tithes and offerings bless the gift and bless the giver in jesus name and everyone said amen Super Saturday outreach is going to be this Saturday, March 23rd. We will be uh, having a big outreach in preparation for Easter, Sunday on the 31st. So they're going to meet at 9.30 a.m. on Saturday for a continental breakfast in the Goder Family Life Center. And then they'll hand out the follow-up cards to go out into the community and follow up uh, with the guests to invite them to Easter. In preparation for the outreach um, on Saturday, we need seven to ten uh, men, young men, that are uh, can meet Brother Blaine after church tonight to go down to the gym to set up for Super Saturday outreach. Can I get a show of hands real quick? Brother Blaine, we've got seven, so we'll go there after church, set up that for Saturday. Everyone said young married couples. It's a launch event this Saturday, March 23rd at 6 o'clock p.m. in the Goder Family Life Center. If you have any questions, you can see Brother Joshua or Sister Kelsey Dunn who are leading up the young marrieds. And so we're excited for that new ministry. Easter Saturday School. So this is March 30th, not Sunday, but Saturday from 12 p.m. to 2 p.m. And as we did last year, we will not be running buses on Easter Sunday, but we will run them on the day before, which is March 30th on Saturday. If you would like to bring your children that Saturday, you are welcome to join in. So this is for March 30th, Saturday, not Sunday, 12 to 2 p.m. Easter Sunday. This is the 31st of March for uh, the FPC campus here. We're gonna have our 10 a.m. worship service. We're gonna have the choir singing, followed by a family fun day with lots of food, activities, and games. We're not gonna have an evening service, but they're gonna open the sanctuary for family prayer at 6.30 p.m. and they're gonna open the gym as well uh, at seven for those who would like to play. So there's a note on parking. We uh, have again reserved the Crutch Field Street parking lot. So if you're please able, please plan to park there on Easter morning to open up spaces for our guests. And I'm sure there'll be more announcements coming that with the shuttle buses go there and back. With that, can we stand tonight? Amen. Everyone said Easter Sunday. Easter Sunday. Amen. We always have a great time around here. 
Amen. Food, bouncy houses, lots of fun for the family, kids. We're going to have a good time. We're expecting a move of the Holy Ghost. Amen. We, we typically have a lot of guests. And as, as this church knows, amen, we know how to have church. We know how to praise our God. We know how to serve our God. We know how to live for God. Amen. I don't know about you, but I'm glad to be in an apostolic church tonight. Find somebody close to you, shake their hand, tell them it's good to see them in the house of the Lord on this Tuesday night.
Let's lift our hands to heaven and bless him. Can we do that? Aren't you thankful? Aren't you thankful for the day that heaven reached down and touched your life? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's bless his name tonight. Let's worship him in this place. Hallelujah. Something happened. And now I know he touched me and made me hope. You know, there's a verse. Oh, now since I met this blessed Savior. Since he cleansed and made me whole, oh, I will never cease to praise him. I'll shout it while he Heroes. Oh, he touched me. Jesus touched me. Oh, he touched me. He touched me. And oh, the joy that floods my soul. Aren't you thankful tonight? Something, something happened, and now I know he touched me and made me whole. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank God for the day that he touched our life. Thank God for the day that he ministered to you. Brought you out of the miry clay. Set your feet on a rock to stay. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. My, that's the words of the blind man when they said, don't give this man glory, he's a sinner. And he said, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. But one thing I know, I was blind and now I see. Jesus touched me. Oh, Jesus touched me. On a Tuesday night, I came to feel the touch of the master's hand. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's lift our hands. Let's entertain the presence of the Lord right now. Right where you are, I want you to lift your voice and speak his name into this atmosphere. Something happened. Now I know. Praise God. Praise God. Sister Del Reeves, Glenn McCauley, April Holly, Kim Woods, Joseph Williams, Joyce Wright. People need healing in their bodies. Amen. Brother Watson, it's good to see you tonight in the house of the Lord. Amen. Brother and Sister Ball, it's good to see you in the house of the Lord. Let's lift our hands and ask God to minister to these needs. Let's speak these names out before his throne right now. Lord, you're a healer. Lord, you're a miracle worker. Reach down into the bodies and the hearts of those names and those that are gathered here and names that we might not have spoken out loud, but you know them, God, and you hear the prayers of your people. I pray, dear God, that you would move. I pray that your Holy Ghost would move. 
I pray for the island of Haiti right now, God, that you would keep your hand on the Senate family and keep your hand on L'Eglise Washla, the church there, God, in Port-au-Prince. Guide them, help them. Put your angels around them tonight. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Praise God. If you've been following the recent events in the news, there's great violence in Haiti right now. And one of our great young men and his wife and children are there in the church that's there. And Sister Alexa Wardrick, her family is all down there. Just remember them when you're praying that God would just watch over them. The Bible says that he that keeps Israel, he neither slumbers nor sleeps. I'm praying that God just moves upon them and helps them. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated in the house of the Lord. My, what a wonderful move of the Holy Ghost. Jesus touched me. Praise God. Jesus touched me. Amen. We're looking for that touch tonight. What great services we had on Sunday. Praise God. The Holy Ghost moved. My father preached a great message Sunday morning. Pastor Galindo preached a great message Sunday night. Amen. I feel the Holy Ghost. I feel a witness in the Holy Ghost that God is up to great things. Amen. Amen. And we're looking forward to Easter. We're looking forward to be inviting people to the house of the Lord. Let's pray that there would be a great turnout and people could be greatly touched by the Holy Ghost. I'm going to believe God for great miracles. Amen. Amen. In the Saturday outreach, we're going to have a wonderful time doing that and so many, so many, so many good things. Uh, we're glad you're here and visiting with us tonight. We want to recognize some people. It's good to have William Pumphrey here again with Brother Rushing. God bless you, William. Glad you're here in the house of the Lord. Lawrence Bond is here. Lawrence, we're glad you're here. God bless you. Brother Caleb Dansby is here. Amen. All the way from the Northwest. Love the Dansby family, precious people of God, doing a great work. And I have some people that are very close to my heart. But Anthony and Sister Inez Durham are here in Durham, North Carolina. Amen. Brother Anthony, Sister Inez, just stand up. Let, let the church see you here real quick. I know you want this. <laughs> Precious people of God, I had the privilege, you can be seated. I had the privilege of pastoring them for several years in Fort Myers, Florida, and they have made Durham their home. And so be sure to meet them and greet them. These are good people. They love God. Good to see Bishop go there tonight. God bless you, Bishop. Love you and honor you. Glad you can be in the house of the Lord. Sister Marley, God bless you. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Amen. God's been good to his people. God has poured out his blessing and his favor upon his people. You can remain standing. We're going we're gonna to read from the word of the Lord tonight. And I want to turn your attention to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. There will not be membership signing for the juniors tonight. That will be this coming uh, Sunday. We will have that. Um, so keep that in mind. This will be ages 17 and down. This is not an official membership signing, but it is uh, a preparation stage for the young ones. And I want to talk with them and see them. That'll be next Sunday. Amen. First John chapter 2. If you have it, say amen. amen. We've been talking, dealing with holiness, and we're going to continue to deal with the topic of holiness we're going to thoroughly explore God's word on this subject because God has a lot to say. And I want to be holy as he is holy. 1 John chapter 2. I'm going to start reading at verse 12. This is what the apostle said. He said, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. Powerful Jesus name passage right there. I write unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because you've overcome the wicked one. 
I write unto you, little children, because you've known the Father. And then he says it again. He, he repeats what he said, and he does that because he's emphasizing it. He wants to drive the point home. And so this is the equivalent of John lifting up his voice. And he says this, I have written unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I've written unto you young men because you are strong and the word of God abideth in you and you have overcome the wicked one. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Amen. And I want to talk to you for a little while on this subject, worldliness. I want to talk to you about worldliness. Tell the person next to you, God told us to come out. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. Let's take a little while and let's talk about what this scripture means as it deals with the world. When I say the world, there's two ways that I can mean the world. I can mean the planet Earth. The planet Earth, we call that the world, the Earth. And the Bible says of that that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus loves us. His motive for teaching us is not to condemn us. It is not to browbeat anybody. It is to show us what the Bible describes as a more excellent way. I want his more excellent way. I want marriages to last. I believe marriages can still be till death do us part. I believe that a person can keep themselves for one spouse. I don't care what the world says. I care what God says. So there's a sense of the world, the planet that we're living on. God loves the world. He so loved the world. But there's another sense that I'm going to talk about tonight, and it's not in reference to the planet. It is in reference to the values, the customs, and the lifestyles, and the choices of people who are not submitted to God. And they're not submitted to his word. And the Bible calls that also the world. These are people who are not interested in what God has to say. They are interested in their own thoughts and doing what's right in their own eyes. So if you're a child of God, there are some phrases you should eliminate from your vocabulary. When it comes to living for the things of God, you should never say something, well, it seems like to me, or... I don't see what the big deal is. Or are you telling me that's really going to send me to hell? The Bible says his ways are not our ways. And then it says his thoughts are not our thoughts. You've got to do some work to find the mind of God. You've got to earnestly seek for the mind of God. What the Bible describes as the mind of Christ. 
And the only way to get that, ladies and gentlemen, is you've got to crucify this flesh. You want to be happy? Crucify this flesh. You want to make it? Crucify this flesh. You want the blessing of the Lord? You want the resurrection? Crucify the old man, the old nature, the carnal nature, or the worldly influence in your life. And that crucifixion doesn't happen one time or two times or three times. It happens every single day. Somebody say every day. Jesus looked at them and he said, you cannot be my disciple unless you deny yourself. So people ask us, why do we live like we live? Why do we make the choices that we make? Why do we not attend certain entertainment venues? Why don't we watch certain things or listen to certain things or drink certain things or smoke certain things? Jesus said, deny yourself. Let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. This godly living is a crucified lifestyle. I'm crucified to the world and I've crucified it what the Bible describes as the affections and the lusts thereof. You have to make a conscious choice to live for the Lord every day. And, and I'm not saying that to say that we just are looking to, to drag people down. We know that in this flesh dwells no good thing. And you cannot have the holy presence of God in a carnal atmosphere. The friendship of the world, the Bible says, is enmity against God. And I can't be the friend of the world and the friend of God at the same time. I can't serve God and mammon at the same time. No man can serve two masters. He will hate one and he will cleave to the other. So I want to talk about the world. We're going to describe the world, and we're going, to, we're going to describe coming out from among them. This worldly, and then the phrase is worldly. The word is worldly. The scripture teaches us to not be worldly. And that's a hard thing to define for some people because you really have to have the Holy Ghost to understand what we're talking about. Some of the words for worldly are carnal. Carnal. That word carnal, the root of it is carne. It means flesh. It's the same word that's in carnival. It's the same word that's in carne asada. <laughs> or chili con carne. It means the flesh. And there is a side to every man and every woman that is fleshly. It is carnal. It is sensual. It does not seek the things of God. If you, if you know your Bible, it is your Esau. It is your Ishmael. It is your Cain. And if I just get right down to it, it is your Adamic nature. It is, that, it is that carnal, fleshly side that delights in the things of this world. And the Bible has this to say about it. It says, flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God. It says to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. In our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm looking for life tonight. I'm looking for peace tonight. I want an end to the drama. I want an end to the chaos. I want an end to the broken homes and the divorces. I want an end to the addictions. The devil works through the flesh. He works through the flesh. He works through the world. And the world's ideas are not God's ideas. The writer of Proverbs told us to trust in the Lord with all of our heart and lean not. Everybody say lean not. lean not. Lean not to your own understanding. 
So when you look at something and say, well, I don't see anything wrong with that, stop it. It's not about what I see wrong with it. It's about what God sees wrong with it. Are you telling me that if I dress like that, that's going to matter? To God, it matters. There is a worldliness, and there's also a spiritualness that we are to strive for. Now, let me take a moment. Let's go to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I want to show you an interesting portion of Scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul is talking to the church at Corinth, and he says this to them. He says, I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For you are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal? And walk as men, people that cause divisions and people that cause envy and strife and people that gossip and spread tales and have little side conversations where they tear people down, are carnal. I'll just throw that in there for free. There's a carnality, and Paul said, if this is your mindset, I can't talk to you. I want to talk to you. I want to tell you great things. I want to talk to you about the great things of God, but you are not able to bear it. We've got to have the mind of Christ. We've got to have the Holy Ghost in our hearts to condition our minds and condition our spirits to where we can receive the things of God. If I try to apply God's principles when I'm full of pride and full of ego and full of opinions and full of my worldly thinking, if the world has informed me as to what is good and I've embraced the world's ideology, I'm not going to fit with what God's doing. The world doesn't care what the Word of God says. The world's not interested in the Holy Ghost. It's not interested in the Bible. And the world is in a lot of trouble. Brother Newton, you said it tonight as you were exhorting. This world is in a lot of trouble. Did you know that the world has no light in itself? None. No light. And that's a powerful example to us. We have no light in ourselves. So if you're sitting there thinking and you're sitting there strategizing and you're making sense of things and it makes sense in the moment, what you're doing is you're using this, what the Bible describes, the wisdom that is from beneath. And it calls that earthly, sensual, and devilish. It's that which we obtained by our senses, by what we see and by what we smell and hear and feel. If you're going to go according to your feelings, it's going to end up badly. But when God, when God put light upon the earth, it had to come from outside of itself. There had to be an instrument that shed light upon the darkness. Amen. Truth has to come from outside of us just as surely as the sun has to shine upon the earth. The Bible calls us children of the day and not children of the night. The Bible says we're supposed to walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, chambering and wantonness, strife and envying. You can remember before you came to Jesus how you used to live. It didn't, it didn't matter how you dressed. It didn't matter how you talked. Didn't matter what you did. Drinking with your buddies, sitting around, uh, getting involved in worldly activities. The world thinks nothing of those dynamics because the world is in darkness. But this Bible says that we are brought out of darkness. Amen. I need Jesus to shine on me. I need the glorious light of the gospel to shine on me. Amen. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And that light shined in darkness.
darkness. Praise God. And he'll shine in my darkness, in your darkness. And he teaches us different ways. Different ways of living. Different ways of, of acting. And Paul was saying to the church at Corinth, I want to tell you the great things of God, but you can't handle it. I'll give you an example. When you come to God, one of the great truths of God is that you bring your tithe and offering to God. If you have a spiritual mind, it is a joy to bring tithe and offering to God. The Bible says that God loves a cheerful giver. I'm glad to be faithful in my tithe and my offering. I want to be faithful in what I give to God. Return it unto the Lord. Hey, God's been good to me. And it is my good privilege and it is my great honor to bring in the first fruits back to him and say, I wouldn't have anything if it wasn't for you, God. Take these first fruits and build the kingdom of God. Spread this gospel through the world. Raise up a great people and a great nation. But the carnal man doesn't think that. Carnal man thinks that you're just bringing your money to a man or to a church or to some earthly establishment. And, and there's, there's a lot to this. I, let, me, let me tell you, you can either drag things down to the earthly level or you can lift things up to the heavenly level. Let me ask you a question. How do you view marriage? How do you view How do you view marriage? People today are viewing marriage as an inconvenience. They're saying, we don't want to get married. This is, this is the situation of the woman at the well. She had given up on marriage, and, and she had simply shacked up with a man. And she was miserable. Did you know the more you chase physical pleasure, the more miserable you'll be? And... And, and people look at marriage today as though it's a restriction, as though they're entering into handcuffs, as though they are destroying their lives, and they have these parties beforehand because it's their last night of freedom. What a pitiful, pitiful, terrible, wicked way of looking at marriage. God made marriage. It is not good for a man to be alone. He made that woman from the rib of Adam. And when he got done, he said, it is very good. I'm going to tell you, it's very good what God does. Marriage is very good. And if you're looking at marriage the same way you're looking at tithe and offering, as an obligation, as something to be avoided, as, as the old ball and chain, If that's what you're looking at things like, you're dragging things down to this earthly, sensual, devilish way where now websites proliferate where people can cheat and people can do things in secret. And, and I'm going to tell you something. What, what a sad state of affairs. When this world, this thinking of this world gets a hold of you, you'll think it's normal to run around on your spouse. It, everything will be wink, wink and nudge, nudge and, and, oh, I'm sorry, we had a few too many to drink last night. You understand, don't you? And that's the way of the world. That's the way the world thinks. The same spirit that says, oh, it's not a big deal. You don't need to dress like that. You don't need to act like that. Also says, I'll sleep with my neighbor's wife or husband. And divorce is the norm. And children are born out of wedlock regularly. Now it's to the point where they just kill them. That's the world. That's the world that says you dress different. You dress funny. You dress, oh, you don't know what you're doing. We don't know what we're doing. You're the ones killing. You're the ones snuffing. How many apostles have been killed before they even got a chance to preach on an abortion table? How many, how many Sunday school teachers have been murdered? How many people have lost? How many great preachers will we never hear because an abortionist ended their life? And we don't know what we're doing? 
We believe that you stay married to the same spouse till death do us part. We fight for it on a daily basis. We believe children are the heritage of the Lord. That's the way heaven believes it. Come out from among them and be separate. The same spirit that says wear immodest clothing and be as risque and seductive as you can be because you've got to snag a man. In the world of one night stands. In the world of drug use and addiction and misery. That's the world. That's worldliness. In the scripture, these dynamics were to be elevated. Marriage is honorable and all. He that findeth a wife findeth a good thing. What a blessing to have children and to raise them in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. What a blessing to fight for them and fight for their future. And if you're here and maybe your parents didn't do that for you, this is your chance to reverse the curse. You can say, what my father did to me, I'll never do it to my son. If your father walked out on you, welcome to the church. That's how the world does it. The world is full of alcoholism and porn and one night stands and chasing things. Ad nauseum. The Bible says in Sodom and Gomorrah that, that, that when the angels struck them blind, they still wearied themselves to find the door of Lot's house. This is a world that it wearies themselves looking for sin. Come staggering in Saturday morning at four in the morning, weary and worn out, and they call that a good time. When you come to God, you don't think like the world. You don't think worldly, but you elevate things. You elevate marriage to where it's supposed to be. And tithe and offering is not a tax. Tithe and offering is a blessing. I don't have to give. I have the opportunity to give. I have an opportunity to be blessed. Thank God he gave me the opportunity to be blessed. I'm not doing this out of force. I'm doing this because God has been so good to me. And I don't want to choke off the blessings. I don't want to turn the spigot off. I want to turn the spigot on. And it takes a crucified mind and a, a spiritual mind and heart. God rejected. He rejected Gideon's men because they lowered themselves to the water rather than to elevate the water to them. Same stuff. Tithe and offering is money. And, and marriage is a husband and wife. Same stuff. But the way you treat the stuff makes all the difference in the world. You can treat it carnal by lowering yourself to it. The Bible says like a dog. And God rejected them. I can't use them. They are not fit to work in my kingdom. Oh, but, but when they cupped that water and raised it to their mouth like a son of God, like who God made them to be, they elevated that to a higher place. God said, that's my army. And there were 300 people that made that cut. Listen, I know that holiness winnows out the crowd. I know that holiness will offend people. I know that you might have 10,000 when you start and 300 when you're done. But you know what? That's what wins the battle. That's who God's, cho God's choosing. Praise God. Praise God. I don't want a crowd. I want a church. I want a church. I don't want people that just show up to have their ears tickled. I want somebody that's going to give their life for Jesus Christ and say, I give you everything, Lord, my body, my soul, my spirit. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. And Paul said, I can't talk to you because you're carnal. You'll get offended. You'll get upset. And so I've got to feed you with milk until you learn to pray, until you learn to read the Bible. 
until you let that Holy Ghost begin to make your nature holy. And then inevitably, if you're reading that Bible and you're praying, you're going to stumble across scriptures like 1 Timothy chapter 2 that said that women are to adorn themselves in modest apparel. Modest apparel. Modest apparel. That's a, that's a church thing. And not just while you're at church. That's a Monday thing. And a Tuesday thing. Can I just talk to the church tonight? You know, there was a time that people in here can remember. And I mentioned this last Tuesday night. I'll say, I'll say it again this Tuesday night. When, if a, if a girl wore pants to school, she was sent home. Well, because people did not hear the word of the Lord... Now you have boys wearing dresses to school. And there was a time that if you wore clothing that indecently exposed your body, that, that they would send you home. There's an interesting story in the Bible where Joshua fights the battle of Jericho and they win and God gives a great victory. It's a great picture of Pentecost. It's a great vic uh, picture of, of the walls. They came tumbling down. And I think walls need to come down in our lives. And when God lets your walls come down, he gives you victory. You can take the promised land. You can take the land for the glory of God. But the scripture says, Joshua told them, don't take anything from that city. It is to be destroyed. It is to be burned with fire. God does not want you to take anything from that city. This world doesn't have anything for me. I don't need its Hollywood. I don't need its sports stars. I don't need its music with its sensuality and its sin. And it is a sin to listen to sinful and worldly carnal music and to watch worldly and carnal things. You can't say I'm not going to do that and watch it all day long. And it, listen, it's one thing, ladies and gentlemen, it's one thing to say I'm not going to watch it because it's wicked. It's a sin to watch sin, to watch someone murder someone, to watch someone commit adultery with someone. This is a great sin. It's not supposed to enter into our minds and our hearts. But the greater danger that is there is the normalization of the world. It is a great danger. And so when... They came from Jericho. The Bible says that a man named Achan, he took a wedge of gold and he took various items. And one of the things he took was a Babylonish garment. That's in your Bible. A Babylonish garment. What is that? What is that? Why would God have a problem with that? They then come to the city of Ai and when they get there, they think they're going to win. They think God is on their side. And the, the city of Ai devastates the army of Israel. They lost their victory. I'm telling you that you can have a great experience with God. And if you still have the world on the inside of you, you can lose victories later on. If you're in love with this world, if you, and this world is enmity against God, the, the things of this world, they are enmity against God. They lost that battle. They, they regrouped. They went to fight again, and they lost again. And, and this amazing story emerges. Finally, Joshua says there has to be sin in the camp. If you've ever heard the phrase sin in the camp, that's where it comes from. And they asked of the Lord, and the Lord finally directed their attention to Achan. And they said of Achan, Achan, did you take something from the city of Jericho? And he said, I did. They said, show it to us. And there it was. It was the wedge of gold. It was the Babylonish garment. God was upset because he was destroying that from off the earth. God was destroying the Babylonish ways, their methods. He didn't want their clothing cut in the fashion of Babylon. He didn't, all you have to do is put it up to your body and say, oh, that's how they did it. 
And the Bible says we weren't to learn their ways. It would, it would become a snare unto us. And so they lost victory after victory because, because of the Babylonish garment and the wedge of gold and the treasures of Jericho. Somebody had fallen in love with the world. The Bible calls the world, it calls it Babylon. It's a place of confusion. And, and listen, apostolics have known this for a long time. And I'm saying this in the context. I've taken two, two different services and I've told you holiness starts on the inside and it works its way to the outside. But I'm going to tell you, the outside matters. You better believe the outside matters. The outside is a reflection of what's going on on the inside. And if you have humility in your heart, there should be humility on the outside. And Babylon is a picture of the world. It's a place of confusion. When, when, a, when a woman dresses revealing and reveals her body, her body, which is the temple of God, and she reveals it to every man and every woman. And when a man reveals his body to every woman and now to every man, then they are taking something that is precious and sacred and they are profaning it and they are corrupting it. Here's what Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. It says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. I want to escape that corruption. I want to get as far away from that worldly way of thinking, that worldly way of dressing, that worldly way of living. I don't want to provoke anybody to the wrong thing. And I don't want to be provoked by the wrong thing. I'm not going to hang around it because I don't want to put any evil thing in front of my eyes. Well, somebody needs to help me out tonight. This is what happens when you come out. This is what happens when you walk away. This is what happens when you say to Babylon, I will not live according to your mandates and according to your value system. This is why, and I, let, me, let me be very clear tonight. The evil genius of Nebuchadnezzar was that was that he could assimilate the nations he conquered. What he would do is he would conquer a nation and he would take the best and the brightest. He would take the princess, princes and the princesses. He would bring them into Babylon and he would sit them at his table. He would feed them Babylonian food. He would give them Babylonian drink. And it tasted good. It was delicious. It was the finest that there was. And I want you to understand that from a New Testament context. When you are watching television or you're watching movies or you're listening to worldly music, you are sitting at Babylon's table. You are letting the Harvey Weinsteins of the world feed you. You are letting the homosexual agenda feed your children. And you cannot sit them in front of that day after day, year after year, decade after decade, and then wonder why they become that. We are not to love the world, nor the things that are in the world. Promiscuity becomes normal. They say today that the average age of porn exposure is now eight years old. Eight years old. That, uh, Governor Abbott just passed a law in Texas that, that uh, pornographic websites were forbidden to, to go after children as young as six, seven, and eight years of age. And, and, and the websites fought him. They were supposed to put disclaimers on there and make it hard for kids to get on that. They want those kids on that. They want them addicted. They want their minds twisted. Those are lifelong customers. And there's a reason why men have lost their minds. There's a reason why, why they can't hold down a stable relationship. There's a reason why they can't love. And now the women have worked to accommodate it. And the men want it. And the women provide it. And the world continues to devolve. That is the world. Praise God. 
The world is at work at all times, and it is Babylon. And it tastes, and it seems as though, the Bible, the Bible calls it the pleasures of sin for a season. And Daniel, and Hananiah, and Mishael, and Azariah, they looked at that Ethiopian, or rather that Babylonian eunuch, and they said to him, we don't want the king's food. That was, that was their, their way of saying, we won't eat that food. And today, when we don't partake in Hollywood, and we don't partake in organized sports, and we don't partake in the things of this world, what we're saying is, we will not eat that food. I don't want that coming in my eyes. I don't want that coming in my ears. I don't want to give my energy to that. I'm coming out of that. I'm not going to dress immodestly. I'm not going to, I'm not going to normalize. Have you noticed, even, even the most jaded and the most hardened among us have, have, are able to look back 60 years, and they can see that 60 years ago, the vast majority of people would have one partner for life. In an ideal situation, it was very common for people to have one husband and one wife. It doesn't mean they were perfect. It doesn't mean that they, had, they did everything right. They were humans. They were flawed. They had problems. But society was a whole lot better. And that's true of white folks, black folks, Hispanic folks. Everybody during that time, they, there was a stable family dynamic. The family's been destroyed in our world. And, and children don't have fathers and boys don't have dads and girls don't have mothers. And, and they're left to fend for themselves. They are left to face predators by themselves because of the, the, the rapacity of the world. That is Babylon, what the Bible calls a cage of every unclean bird, every unclean spirit. And God is against Babylon. So this Daniel and the three Hebrew children, they said, we will not eat of it. And they thought they were crazy. They said, you can't. You have to eat it. Everybody knows you have to eat it. And there are people that think you're crazy and I'm crazy because we won't watch television. We won't go to movies. We won't play organized sports. We won't get involved in things like that. They think, well, you've lost your mind. You're in Babylon. You have to do those things. No, no, we really don't. What you put in your eyes and what you bring into your ears, that's what you will become. You think school shootings are just happening out of nowhere? This, this world is so double-minded. It'll tell you, ah, it's just music. Or they'll say of movies, it's just art. It's not real. But yet you teach them to murder and you teach them to to commit adultery and you teach them to flirt and to commit fornication. By the time they're 12 and 13, you've got kids that are, that are trying to live adult lives. You've got 12 year olds that look like they're 25 years old and they're dressing immodestly and, and they're, they're putting themselves out there. What a, what, a, what a broken, broken way of thinking and living. God wants his people to be holy. At the same time, they're losing control of children. They can't, they can't lead children. They, they, they can't um, guide them and, and instruct them and bring them into the ways of the Lord. You know what the Bible says. You train up a child in the way that it should go. And when it is old, it will not depart from it. I think we need to raise up people that love God. Raise up people that, that keep themselves from the world. Amen. James 1 and 27, pure religion and undefiled before God and the father is this to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world today there's single mothers and there's there's single parent households single fathers that that it's it's a it's a an epidemic in society today and the government has incentivized people to live separate and they've glorified and glamorized wicked lifestyles. And they've done that through television. They've done that through the entertainment industry. And what heartache. There's no greater driver of poverty than single parenthood. The single parent 
struggles and fights. And my heart goes out to every single parent that is here right now. My prayers are with you. I know it's hard, but God has great things in store for you. I love the people that come from that and say, you know what? There's a better way. There's, I'm going to raise my children to love God. I'm going to raise my children to control their mind. I'm going to raise my children to be full of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to teach them character and teach them the love of God and the fruit of the Spirit and to become a child of the Most High God. This is what it means to, to walk away from worldliness. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, Paul said, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. This present world, he loves this present world. I was, I was talking to someone one time, and they, they didn't understand these principles. And they had a little daughter. She was about 10 years old, and it was a friend of mine. And, and he was saying, he was saying, pray for me because her mother wants to paint her face and wants to put her in tight clothing and she's only 10. And I looked at him and I said, you realize that you're telling me that you know it's wrong. You know it's wrong to do that. When, when a woman does that, she is becoming like the world. Instead of wearing modest clothing. What is modest clothing? Modest clothing is clothing that covers the neckline above the collarbone. It's, it's sleeves that come down to the middle of the arm and, and, and skirts that go well below the knee and pants on men. The, this is what, as the church, we wear modest apparel. It shouldn't be so tight that it leaves nothing to the imagination. It might, you can wear a dress that goes down to your ankles, but if it's saran wrapped around you, it doesn't, fit the bill of holiness. You shouldn't have to accentuate your figure for everybody to, to look at and for you to flit around. And boys, your pants shouldn't be so tight that it leaves nothing to the imagination. But you should be holy before God. You should be modest before God. There shouldn't be something inside of you that says, look at me, look at me, let me get attention. That's not beauty, that's lust, that's vanity, that's the wrong spirit. That's the spirit of the world. That's not the spirit of God. That's the lust of the eye and the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. And God hates that spirit. Listen, God doesn't hate that spirit because he's looking down on you and condemning you. God hates that spirit because he hates sin. And God hates sin because he loves you. And he knows what sin does to you. He knows what sin does to your marriage. He knows what sin does to your brain. He knows what sin does to your family. God's not trying to spoil the party. God's trying to establish you in the earth. Godly wife, when she walks out of the house, she should be dressed modestly. And her husband shouldn't have to worry about other men looking at her. And he shouldn't have to worry about why she wants to wear skimpy clothes anyway. Well, I have to be beautiful. I have to. That's the world's definition of beauty. That's not God's definition of beauty. That's, the Bible describes it in the book of Revelation as the attire of a harlot. So there's, there's now clothing that, that women wear and men wear that if you went back generations past, that is what prostitutes wore. That is what men of the night wore. Now, everybody wears it. And you wonder why fornication is so common. And we wonder why divorce is so common. You know, there, the, if the devil can lure you into that sensuality and that sensual lifestyle, that marriage doesn't have a chance. It doesn't have an, an opportunity to flourish and thrive. Marriage has to have God in the middle of it. Marriage is a man that is crucifying his old nature. And 
and I'm not, when I talk about crucifying the old nature, I'm not trying to talk about it like it's a bad thing. Because with every crucifixion, there's resurrection. My crucifixion is because I'm pursuing the resurrection. Praise God. I'm pursuing the resurrection. You can't resurrect if you don't die. But if I die, I will live. Amen. I will live. And Christ will live inside of me. And when people see me, they don't see me. They see the Jesus in me. They're not, they're not seduced by the flesh. They're, they're, they're attracted by the discretion and by the faith and by the joy and by the love of God. They're attracted to the power of God. They're attracted to the Holy God that is ready to heal and to deliver and to save. So women, you shouldn't want to dress that way. And men, you shouldn't want them to. Let me talk to the men for a second. As the man goes, so goes the world. Men have great power. And if men are enamored with, with women in skimpy clothes and that's what they're chasing, that's what women will do. And it'll get to the point where women will finally give up and turn to another woman. That's how the world operates. And so, so, men in the church, when a young lady walks in, be attracted to her godliness. That's an attractive thing. A godly woman is the most beautiful thing in the world. Her uncut hair, her makeup free face, her modest clothing. Don't you walk by her for the little tart that's walking by, that's pushing the boundaries and trying to see what she can get away with and, and swishing as she walks. And don't you, don't you be a dimwit and be attracted to that and let those, let those godly girls, what in the world do you think they're thinking as you're pursuing that? That's not somebody that you marry. You marry someone that loves God and someone that has the beauty of holiness and, and is righteous. That is an attractive thing. And ladies, don't you go for the rebel without a cause. Don't you go for the guy with his arms folded standing in the back trying to get out of church as fast as he can that's rebelling and doing everything crazy. You, you Ladies, you chase that dancer, that worshiper, that one that gets in the altar and says, take my life, God. Make me what you want it to be. I want to live holy before you. If he'll live holy for God, he'll live holy for you. You won't have to worry about where he's at on Saturday night. He'll be getting ready for the house of God. Praise God. When you live holy, you don't have to worry if your spouse picks up your cell phone. Oh, sweetheart, let me check a few things on your phone. <gasps> Sweat starts breaking out. Because when you've got something broken on the inside and when you're looking at stuff you shouldn't be looking at, and you don't have to clear your internet trail. You don't have to have secret apps that disappear within 10 seconds after you did whatever it is you were doing. That's the world. Listen to me. You don't want somebody doing that to you, and you don't do that to them. You love your neighbor as yourself, and you walk holy before your God. That's how the world operates. But we're not of the world. We're, we're not of Babylon. We're of Jerusalem. We're of the house of God. Remain standing. Musicians can come. Praise God. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. Hallelujah. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. 
I want to tell you, it's hard to define worldliness. It's just when, when, when someone walks in and they allure and they seduce. The Bible says they wink with their eyes and they speak with their feet. It's called body language. And it's of the world. And it's carnal. Be careful how you talk. You can tell if a person's been praying by how they talk. If you're telling off-color jokes, if, you're, if you can't control where your eyes are looking, the Bible says of a woman that she's supposed to be shamefaced. It says, and it's true of a man as well, be careful where your eyes look. You treat people with, with dignity. The Bible says that you treat women, men treat women as mothers and sisters in the Lord. And I want to be the kind of man that women can trust. I don't want to be the kind of man that makes them uncomfortable when I'm there. But I want to be a steward of the things of God. I feel the Holy Ghost. The most terrifying thing that, that is a result of worldliness is that the presence of the Lord will depart. That the beautiful Spirit of God will depart. Somebody told me one time, they said, we would come to your church. We love what we feel in your church, but we just don't want to dress like that. And we just don't want to live like that. If you just get rid of that, we'd come. And, and, and the Holy Ghost would be gone when you got here. You cannot live for the world and expect the Holy Ghost to have free course in this place. I, I, I make these choices and I present my body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is my reasonable service because I love Him. That joy that floods my soul, that beautiful presence of God it starts to cleanse my conscience and cleanse my mind and it kills every ugly, wicked thing. Praise God. <laughs> the Bible has a lot to say. The Bible says in Philippians 2, verse 15, that you may be blameless and harmless. You know, I, I look down and I see my grandbaby. And when she looks at you, it'll just melt you and she looks at you and she just looks, looks dead at you. <laughs> and that little blameless and harmless life, something fierce rises inside of me when I think that anybody would ever hurt or take advantage or exploit the innocent. And that should happen in your life. Listen, to everybody here, every man in here that's wrestling with, with the digital world and the internet, Understand that the devil will warp your mind and will get you to where you objectify people. You'll reduce them to their body parts. And I'm not trying to get graphic. I know we're in mixed company, but I'm telling you that's somebody's mother and it's somebody's sister and it's somebody's daughter. And we're supposed to be blameless and harmless in this world. And it's worth fighting for. And it's worth contending for. Don't you be a predator. Don't you, don't you exploit people. Praise God. Blameless and harmless. The sons of God. Without rebuke. In the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. Among whom you shine as lights in the world. When I walk into the room, I want to shine when I walk into there. I don't want my self-righteousness. All right, you bunch of sinners, I'm here to straighten you all out. That's not what God called us to do. But he called us to be blameless and harmless. And when you walk in into a place, there should be joy that walks in there with you. There should be the love of God that walks in there with you. 
there should be kindness and decency and integrity that walks in there with you. Praise God. Oh, let's lift our hands to heaven and ask God to help us tonight. Hallelujah. Come out of Babylon. Come out of Egypt. Come out of Sodom. Come out of Gomorrah. Come out of this world. It's worldliness. And it has no place in God's house. Oh, let's love him right now. Let's ask God to move in our midst. Move in this place. Hallelujah. 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 Somebody lift your hands and lift your voice. Glory to God. Can we just love God together right now? I want to walk holy before Him. I want to please Him. I want, to, I, want to, I want Him to say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Cleanse me from the secret faults. Cleanse me from the wrong motives and the wrong spirit. Create in me a clean heart and renew in me a right spirit, O oh God. I'm going to open up this altar. I want somebody to come in these last few minutes of this service on a Tuesday night as they sing. lift our hands all over this house let's thank God 
Can we bless his name right now? Can we bless his name right now? Hallelujah. Let's love God in this house. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Glory to God. Glory to God. I want to say something before we dismiss. We're not just saying we don't do this, we don't do that, we don't do this, we don't do that. You can't come up with a list that's comprehensive enough to stop people from living in sin. They'll find a loophole somewhere and they'll find some weird way to do things. But what we are doing is fighting for a spirit of holiness and we're setting standards by which we're going to live our life. Godly standards to uphold godliness. And this is not just for you. This is for your children. We're going to get into this, but I'm just going to say it very quickly. The Bible says, make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame. Some translations say weak or or. Um, somehow diminished and it, it means those that are weak in faith and, and children lest that which is lame be turned out of the way praise god god's god's gonna raise up an army god's gonna raise up an army of people that are anchored in his word and love him more than they love babylon and love him more than they love this old world and this is not a restrictive message. This is a message that establishes God's ways. And when you get his ways, there's nothing in this world that can stop you. When you get his ways, his blessing comes upon you. When you get his ways, his glory comes upon you. You become beautiful for situation. The joy of the whole earth. You become the city set on the hill. Praise God. Praise God. Happy are the people in such a case. And happy are the people whose God is the Lord. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Take the word of the Lord with you. Greet one another. Shake one another's hands. Love one another. God be good to you tonight.